And so I'm going to try to sit down and teach tonight. Um, and so I want to spend time, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. This is the um, part two of good grief. And um, let me read the verses. And um, I'm hoping that I can finish up what we started last week to really help people deal with the issue of grief. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. If you, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians, thank you. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. So powerful. I want to I wanna make sure I'm clear that we're clear about something. When I talk tonight about suffering and being comforted from suffering, this conversation is not limited to death. Grief is not always about death. So I don't want, if you're sitting here like, well, I haven't really lost anyone, so this may not really be for me. There, there are lots of, when you go through life transition, that brings about grief at times. You know, there are people in this room that have survived natural disasters where you left your house and came back, everything was gone. There's an element of grief attached to that. As I talked about last week, when we go through divorce, there is an element of grief attached to it. People that have great careers and they wind up disabled and no longer able to do the work they were doing. There's a grief attached to that. People that were doing well financially lose their job and then have to start all over. There's a grief attached to that. So as I minister this tonight, it is broader than just death. It is loss that's attached to my emotion. And I want us to understand how we navigate through that. I'm going to say something to two specific situations before I, I start teaching through the exposition of this. I gave you the, if you didn't hear last week, I want you to go back and listen to it because tonight I want to deal with the exposition of verses three to seven. But I want to speak to two situations first because this is a group counseling session. Um, first of all, and we've dealt with this in our community this week. First of all, I want to just briefly talk about when a parent loses a child. Um, when, when you lose a child, it's like losing a part of you. Like there's, I want us to understand the complexity of this grief. And what I'm about to say is true both of losing a spouse and losing a child. When you lose either a spouse or a child, you have hopes and dreams for that person. You have hopes and dreams for your child, something, something that you see them wanting to grow up to be. You have hopes and dreams for your husband or your wife. You know, you want to be there when they retire. You want to see, you have some hopes. I need you to get this. And your hopes for them are embodied in them. So the hope a parent has for a child, that hope, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping they graduate high school and go to college. Right. 
I'm hoping they grow up happy. I'm hoping they, they have a good paying job. I'm hoping they come into relationship with the Lord. That hope I have gets picked up and gets stuffed in their body. So that person now is embodying my hope. When they die, my hope died. So there is a complexity with that loss. The other difficulty about losing a child is that oftentimes it gets compounded. And let me show you where I am. Let me show you where I am because I'm going to be talking for a while before I totally undress the text. Verse 4, who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who, we, who are in any trouble with the comfort, comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. There's a reason I can, I can plainly and clearly teach this. Because we are comforted, and then we in turn comfort others with the comfort that we are giving. Some of y'all going to get mad, which is why I don't need to say a whole lot to somebody who's going through something I've never gone through. Because according to the scriptures, I comfort with the comfort I got. And let me say it like this. You don't have that kind of comfort anointing to be the conduit that God uses to comfort somebody in something you ain't never been in. One of the worst things we can say to folk is, baby, I understand how you're feeling. So I'm, I'm trying to minister to you and comfort you with the comfort that I've been comforted in trying to give you understanding because I've walked this. So the complication of losing a child is compounded because of the feeling that I failed in my responsibility to protect them. Wow. Wow. Keep a pen in all this because when I start pulling this out, it's going to all make sense. It is also difficult because it violates the natural order of life. We are intended, our children are intended to outlive us. Amen. They should be burying us. Now, what about a spouse? We have a lot of widows in this room and widowers in this room. Let me say a few things about this. One reason it's very difficult to gain comfort when I lose my spouse is because like it or not, see, like it or not, there is identity attached to marriage. So when you get married, you identify as thus and such as wife. That is my husband. When that person dies, that identity is lost. And I know you can feel all day long, well, that's going to always be my husband. That's going to always be my wife. The reality of it is the identity gets lost. In the same way as children, my hopes and my dreams for my spouse are embodied in my spouse. And when they die, those hopes and dreams die too. In many situations, you lose your soulmate. In many situations, you lose your life mate. In many situations, you lose the person that knew you more deeply than anybody else. Pastor, why are you, why are you setting it up this way? Because I want us to understand that counseling my way through this is not enough. I, I, need, I need counseling. I need therapy. But therapy without God 
won't get me where I need. So now let's pick up our Bible and let me walk you through why I need God. Do I have anybody in Bible study that's had a loss in your life and you know in your spirit the only way you got through it was the Lord getting you through that thing? Come on, tell somebody it was the Lord that pulled me through that thing. I, and it's going to be the Lord to pull you through that thing. Look at what he says. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. He starts in chapter 3, uh, ch uh, chapter 1, verse 3. Everybody say blessed. blessed. It, it is the Greek word eulogatos. It, 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 it literally means he opens up. I need you to get this. He opens up the statement around our getting comforted, which means I had to go through trial, tribulation, and loss. He opens up the statement by saying you are blessed. Isn't that strange? Because, see, Satan would have you to feel like you've been cursed. Wow. Satan would have you to feel like there's nothing left. Right. Satan would have you to feel like I don't want to move on. God says it's exactly the opposite, that no matter what happens in your life and what goes on in your life, I want you to be able to be convinced you are still blessed. Right. That, that, that means that, can I tell you what the word means? That word blessed in this text means adoration. It means praise. It means gratitude. It, it means that whatever begins to happen in my life, I have to always remember that God is still good. As a matter of fact, say to yourself, God is still good. I need, I need you to get that thing in your spirit. When you are looking at somebody on a ventilator, you got to begin by saying, but God is good. When you are looking over the casket of a family member, you got to say to yourself, but God is still good. You got to rehearse that thing in your spirit until every spirit of grief begins to walk away. God is still good. Now notice what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God, it doesn't say of some comfort. Let me give you the first blank, this Roman number two in your handout. Jot this down. The first thing I want you to see about good grief tonight, this is me now walking through the text. The source, that blank is the word source, the source of our comfort. There, he is the father of mercy and the God of all comfort. Which means if there will ever be any comfort in my life, God must be the origin of it. This is why I want to tell you, I, this is why it's so important for us to understand. Y'all have heard me teach this before, but you need to hear it again. We live in a fallen world. Your mother got sick and died because of Adam and Eve. Your daddy got debilitated because of the fallen nature of humanity. Please hear this. Had Adam and Eve not sinned in the garden, nobody would have gray hair. No one would die. No one would ever be sick. Wow. No one would ever have to sweat. Childbearing would not have pain attached to it. Please hear me. There are no migraines if Adam and Eve don't sin. There's no, there's no young men shooting each other with glocks had Adam and Eve not sinned. I need you to get in what I'm saying in the spirit realm which means 100% of everything we deal with that causes us sorrow is because of sin, which means everything I deal with has a spiritual element to it, which means there's only so far the counselor can take me. There's only so far the therapist can take me. There's only so far alcohol can take me. There's only so far the things of the world can take me. If I want lasting, permanent comfort, the source of the comfort is God. So let me say something about this comfort of God. Number, and this is what I want you to see, y'all. You just got to, you got to lean into him. 
You got to talk to them. You got to be mad with them. You got to ask them questions. You got to express your frustration. And I'm going to teach you all of that tonight. I'm going to give you some steps again tonight. But you got to get through the exposition with me. For those of you that don't know that word, when we say we're exposing the text, all it means is when we read a text to you, it is fully clothed. It has on a hat, shoes, scarf, coat, it's got on pants. When I get done teaching, it's naked. That means you see it for all it means. That's biblical exposition. So, so, so know this about the source of our comfort. Jot this down. Here's the first thing that he says. I'm going to just walk you through it. Bless. Eulogetos. Gratitude, adoration, praise. That means I'm expecting to praise him even in it. Be the God, watch this, he's the, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father, it's said twice now, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father, so here's the first thing we know about the source of this comfort. The first thing we know is right, it's the Father's. Let me tell you what it means, that the source of his comfort means it is paternal. Oh, it's going to be so good. It, 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 let me tell you something about his paternity. Um, his paternity is warm. His paternity is such that he can know everything about how I feel. And he responds in a loving way what I'm willing to share with him. A good, good father doesn't betray you when you're hurt. A good, good father, I wish I had my parents helping me. See, a good father knows, oh God, it's going to be so good. A good father knows I can't deal with all my children the same way. A good father knows where children are weak, what they need spoken to about them. So his comfort is paternal in nature. Which means he's looking at what you're dealing with specifically. He's aware of your unique situation. None of us are. You missed it. Nobody else, no, no human being that comforts you has the capacity to fully get where you are. But God... Comfort is paternal in nature. Now, this is, this is where I was like, oh, Lord, how do I teach this? Notice what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, that means it's paternal, of mercies. Oh. Before he speaks to him as God of comfort, he makes sure we know he's a father of mercy. Uh-oh. This is going to get tight. Let me give y'all this sub point, and then I'm going to have to minister, but it's going to help somebody. Underneath where I have it is paternal. This is what I want you to jot down. As our father, everybody say, as my father. As our father, suffering can be a form of demonstrated mercy. Ooh. I'm about to say something that can change our lives. Who has ever had a loss and it hurt as bad as you could have ever, it hurt worse than you ever thought it was going to hurt? Am I the only one? Come on, who I have, be, be honest, that pain was worse than you thought it was going to be. This is what I, it's going to make you shout if you can get it in your spirit. It's only because of God's mercy it wasn't worse than that. Wow. Jesus. Y'all didn't, y'all, y'all didn't get that thing in. Look, can, I'm, I'm gonna try this one more time. Who here has had a pain worse than you ever thought was gonna be there? Am I the only one? Now, I want you, now look at your own hand. It wasn't so bad to make you kill yourself. You know why? Because it was demonstrated mercy. 
I know it hurts. I know it's rough. I know it's bad. But God said, trust me, baby. It couldn't be a whole lot worse than this. But because of my mercy, I know. I, can I tell you about God? See, God will let you get in hot water. God will let you feel the heat. But while he's looking at you, he got his hand on you, taking your temperature and the temperature in the water. And he know when it's time enough to pull back the thermostat because you can't handle no more. And I don't know about you, but with all I've been through, I'm still grateful to God that it's not worse than what it was. The source of his comfort, it, what if? Somebody shout, what if? What, see, we, you pray to get close to him. Don't y'all look at me like that. Come on, how many of y'all pray for more wisdom? How many of you have prayed for, for a closer walk with him? How many of you pray for more joy? How many of you pray for more blessings? How many pray for great? What if? The way to get me to what I've been asking for is to take me down a road I would have never gone down on my own because he loves you too much. Oh, God. I don't know who this is for. He loves you too much to give you lesser than what you asked for. And so, Cynthia, through the pain, what if? What if? In order for me to be the preacher I wanted to be, I asked him for it. See, we assume that God answers my prayer with a smile. What if the answer causes teardrops? Uh, what if the loss created a greater blessing than what I requested? What if in my prayer of God save my daddy? What if in my prayer of God don't let me lose my child? What if in my prayer of God heal my mama? What if God was listening and said, I'm going to do more than what you asked for? But the way I'm going to do it is not through my healing of your mother. It's through what I'm going to do with you because she wasn't healed. <sighs> He's the source. See, this is why you have to know him. An unsaved person can't connect with nothing I'm teaching. This is why you have to know him. Because he is the source. Which means, I'm going to kill the devil right now. Which means, don't you ever say, I won't ever get through this. Now, you won't get through it the same you. But because he is the source of comfort, and because you are saved, that's a lie. You gonna get through this, baby, because you have a God of comfort. So, this comfort is paternal. But there's another thing this verse 3 says. That not only is this comfort paternal, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of, of mercies and God of all comfort, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our. That means the source of his comfort is paternal. Everybody say our. our. Matter of fact, look at somebody when you say, tell them our. our. Right? That, this is what he's saying. He's saying that the source of this comfort is not only paternal, but the source of this comfort is personal. It is, let me, let, me, let me park here for a minute. See, every death is different. That's not hard to say amen to. Every, 
every death is different. And because every death is different, everybody's grieving process is different which is why we can't tell folk how to grieve. And we can't to tell folk, I'm gonna teach this in a minute, how long to grieve. And we can't wonder what's wrong with people when they don't appear to be grieving. That's a whole nother devil to kill. I don't really understand. She must not love her husband as much as we thought. He ain't died and she ain't shed a tear. Oh, so you the expert on how to grieve? There are layers. There, there, is, there, is, there is a continuum. Let me say it that way. There is, there is a death continuum based upon circumstance. There's a circumstantial continuum. And the, based on where you are on the continuum and where you are in your own personal walk, it determines how we grieve. Let me help you process it for a moment. This is why we need God. That's all I'm, this is what I'm trying to prove right now for these first few minutes. So as an example, now I'm giving you just the continuum. We still have our own ways of grieving within the continuum. On this side, it's generally easier. And on this side, it gets a little bit harder. So here's the first continuum. This is just, I'm just teaching y'all because we don't talk about this stuff, y'all. That's why I'm spending time on it. I want you to process through it with me. Here's the continuum. Let me give you a couple examples. Over this side of the continuum is, is natural death. You know, I'm, 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 I'm 93 and just my time. Over here is unnatural death. You know, I'm just, I'm healthy. I, I run every day. I'm in good shape. And I went on a run, had a massive heart attack at 36, and died. Wow. Wow. Oh my God. That, now I'm just giving you the continuum. I want you to process. That usually is harder than that. Um, um, 93, 19. That's usually, y'all helping, all right. Mama died, daddy died peacefully in their sleep last night. My son got gunned down. Tends to be. Um, my daddy's been battling pancreatic cancer for the last six years. He passed on last night. My husband got up, he got in the shower, had a heart attack in the shower, and just died. I'm trying to prove to you why you need God. Um, um, my daddy died last night. My mama, my daddy, and my sister died in a car accident last night. There are continuums to this. And based upon the circumstances of people dying, it impacts how we grieve. Let, let me, this is why we need God. You, you can't counsel your way through this by itself. I need God. This is going to shock you. Comfort is really counterintuitive. It doesn't go like we think it goes. Pastor, what do you mean by that? Troubled relationships. See, most folk intuitively think, I'm, I have a harder time grieving because we were so close. That's not true emotionally. Let me tell you what's true emotionally. When my relationship with you is troubled and we have unfinished and unresolved issues and you die before we work it out, 
that's more difficult for me to work through than to know this was somebody I loved, I had quality time with them, I was with them to the end. It's complicated. Can I minister for a minute? That's why I need to stop acting like I got five more years to work it out with the people that I claim to love. That if there's been issues and hardship and difficulty, I want you to get it right right now. So when you look over at their casket or they look over at yours, it won't be we had unfinished business. That's a hard grief. You want a hard grief? Your last conversation was, I hate you. That's a hard grief. That's harder than, baby, I love you. I'll see you when you get home. The hard grief is slamming the door in his face. Only to find out he ain't coming back through the door no more. I want us to be proactive in our unfinished business. So when the time of loss comes upon my life, I don't have to deal with the grief from the lens of an additional complication. So, blessed be the God, I'm, I'm still in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy, so it is paternal, and the God of all comfort, our Lord Jesus Christ, it is personal. Let me say something about it being personal. God is both the producer and the provider of our comfort. Wow. So good. See, all of it comes from him. He produces it, and then he provides me with it. Now, let me park here for a moment. How does he provide me with it? This is the sub-point to that point. If God is the, is the producer and the provider of my comfort, and he is, he provides and produces by his presence and his people. So this is very important. When you get a phone call from somebody, that's God providing his people to comfort you. It, even if you don't return, when you look at your phone and you got 15 missed calls and voice messages, but you too, too hurt and too grieving to even, even listen to them. Know that the reason those 15 people called is because God is providing his people to give you comfort. So that I don't have to, oh boy. So I don't have to worry about God, where were you when my son died? The same place he was when his son died. He gets it. He's the God of all comfort. That means he has an absolute monopoly on comfort. It means that the franchises come from him. So his churches, his people, those are franchisees of God's comfort. All true and all lasting comfort is going to come from him. It was the God of all comfort that Jesus assured his disciples that I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send you another comforter. Thank you, Lord. Number one, he is the source of comfort. Don't worry, I'm going to give you some steps in just a minute. Here's number two, Roman numeral three. Not only does he show us the source of comfort, he says in verse four now, who comforts us in all, everybody say all. all. That's my second point, Roman numeral three, is the scope of his comfort. There is nothing I can go through that he does not have the ability to provide comfort for. He says, I am the source of all. He says, who comforts us in all our tribulations. So I don't ever want you feeling as if don't nobody get me. 
That's not true. That don't tell that lie. I may not get you. Your sister may not get you. But God is the source of all our, he comforts me in all of my tribulations. All right, let me pause here for a moment and give y'all some action steps. Let me give you some steps. I gave you some last week that's going to sound a little bit familiar. I want to say some things again. Here's some action steps. Number one, let me, let's talk about how he starts metering out this comfort. And it's not in your note sheets, but I know we need, how, we, how do I do this? How do I live this thing out? Here's the number, first thing I want you to do. First thing I want you to write down is be patient. Be patient. I need to give myself time to heal emotionally. But I, but I need you to understand how God provides healing. He doesn't provide healing with me laying on the sofa, never getting up. He doesn't provide healing with me just, you know, blocking everybody and everything out. Now, I need you to hear this. This is where people get confused. Don't think that just because you're trying to return to your normal routine, that it means you're not still grieving your dad, your husband, your father, mother. It doesn't mean I'm good. It means that I'm trusting God to use my routines, to use the steps I'm making as a conduit for my healing. So you got to get back to your routine. All right. Part of the getting, so when I say to be patient, keep a routine, get a lot of rest. Don't try to do too much, but also don't do nothing. So first it's just be patient with yourself. I always say to myself, oh, give yourself grace and space. Just be patient. It's going to happen. It's going to take time. Here's the second thing I want you to write down. Not just be patient, but secondly, I want you to write down, maintain my friendships. It is really important. You got to be selective. You can't talk to everybody. Everybody not going to help. Everybody not going to understand. But I want you to be thoughtful and prayerful about who can I share how I'm feeling to. I'm going to say some more about that in a minute. So let somebody comfort you. I just said something very powerful. Let somebody comfort you. Let somebody share on the journey of healing. I don't want to go through a healing process and when I get on the other side of it, try to take all the credit for me being better because I never trusted anybody else with my process. See, sometimes we want to be super spiritual. I got this. Baby, let me say this in love. No, you don't. You don't have it. You need someone else that you invite into the healing process. And we're going to give out cards about this tonight. Find you a support group. Yes. Amen. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. I'm going to tell you why in a minute. So maintain my friendships. Be patient. Third big step tonight. Learn how to feel the pain. <sighs> I think one of the biggest mistakes we can make in healing is trying to sidestep the depth of the pain. I don't need to numb myself. I don't need to drink myself until I fall asleep. I need to take time to feel the pain. Remember when I taught us last week that this journey of my emotional healing is parallel to when I damage my body and I have to begin healing physically? I, I was a very... Um, um, I, I played a lot of sports growing up, and hey, I was not a bad athlete, but I was just clumsy. Um, so I broke a lot of bones. You know, like I, I broke both my arms when I was like three. Wow. You know, and I probably broke my right arm five times, my left arm about four or five times. And in, 
and breaking a bone, what keeps you from damaging it further is when you can feel the pain. There are diseases of people that wind up damaging themselves because they don't have the ability to know they're hurting themselves. When you and I are trying to heal, the worst thing I can do is to act like I don't want to feel the pain. I need to feel the pain. And, and, so, and so the intensity of the pain is normal. And eventually it subsides. But I've got to feel it. Um, I don't want to hide my feelings. Let me tell you why. One of the worst things I can do is hide my feelings because when I hide my feelings, it causes me problems in other areas. So when I hide my feelings, it causes me problems emotionally, it causes me problems spiritually, and it causes me problems physically. And so I don't want to hide my pain. Um, and then number four, I'll give you two more of these, I'm going to go back to the exposition. Number four, realize that grief is normal. Um, it is expected. It's healthy to react to a loss. Um, I, I, this is what I call it, giving people the dignity of their process. Letting folk have their process that they go through in order to get to a better place. And then I want you to jot this down. I want you to jot down a four-letter word. H-E-A-L. I want you to look in the mirror and tell you Heal. Amen. Amen. Matter of fact, put your hands on stuff and just say heal. I, I want you to get this thing in your spirit. It helps me to redirect my energy away from, well, if only this had happened. Or I wish I had time to do this. No, tell yourself you got to heal. I'm going to leave that go. I could say more about that, but I want to get through the sheet tonight. Here's the third thing the text teaches us. It's still in verse 4. Who comforts us in all of our tribulations that we may be able, everybody say able. able. Stop right there. It's the source of my comfort. It is the scope of my comfort. And now God says, for what I'm going through, for what I'm feeling, I am still able. Gosh. Satan would have you to think you're going to be stuck and can't ever do anything again. The word says that in this state, I need, not a year from now, not 10 years from now, in this moment, I'm still able. Which is what? It's, we talked about the source of the comfort and the scope of the comfort. What is this, Pastor? This is the strength of our comfort. The strength of my comfort is that I'm still able. You know, I, I don't, it's a good question, so I'm not trying to beat you up. So don't hear that. Y'all know I love you too much for that. But I want us to be more discerning. I want us to be more um, intuitive spiritually. I want us to learn to, to ask deeper, more critical questions. I want us to start saying, does that even sound right? So let me tell you what the question is. Everybody ask it. Why do good things happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? Now, I'm not saying it's a horrible question, but I want us to be deeper thinkers. Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, the first assumption then is that they're good people. Uh -huh. 
when we all have sinned. And the second assumption is that what happened was actually bad. It could have been God's way of what if. I want us to get beyond the surface level way of processing it like people who are not in faith process stuff. As believers, I want to process it from the perspective of in this moment, I am able to comfort those who are in any trouble. So there is a strength I've still got. As a matter of fact, I'm about to bless you. You have a strength now that you would not have had without it. You are actually stronger now. So let me say two things about how strong you are. Tell your neighbor, I'm actually stronger now. I want you to get it in your spirit. Even if you don't feel like it, I want you to own it. I'm actually stronger now. Let me tell you how much stronger you are now. I'm so much stronger now. Look at the B, the B portion of verse 4. Who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves. Let me tell you how strong you are. I'm comforting you with the comfort I got. It's going, to help. it's going to really help if you get it in your spirit. Where is the comfort? It's in me. But I need comforting. But you have more in you than you need just for you. You are so strong that not only do you have what you need, you got enough in you to give somebody else what they need. Oh, God. I just won't get through this. That's a lie. Not only will you get through it, you won't get through it. Here's the word, with overflow. Oh, God. Everybody say overflow. I, that, 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 he says, you comfort with what was given you. So it comes into me. I'm processing it in my spirit. And now when you go through something, I'm giving you the overflow of what was given to me. That's how strong you are. Talking about, I'm going to get through this. That's a lie. Not only, good Lord, somebody going to run around this room with me. Not only are you going to get through it, you're going to take somebody with you to get them through it. Oh, God. Ah. So, there is the overflow of this comfort. See, that's why I need God. Because only God is going to give me enough for somebody else. I got to hurry up. All right, here we go. Verse 5. So, any trouble with, with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by my counselor. With which we ourselves are comforted by my therapist. I'm not knocking counselors and therapists. I hear that. I'm telling you that by itself will not get you what you need. I need God. That I'm comforted by God. Now look at this. This is mind-boggling. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us. Oh. oh. So what's really going through in me is the abundance of what he's gone through that now is in me. Which means what I went through was never about me. It was always about So let see, we think, jot down the word object. This is the object of, the object of my comfort. When I say the object, I'm talking about a person to which the specified action is being directed. He's saying that as you and I go through stuff, I'm really only going through his sufferings that are operating now in me. Why? 
because the only way I reign with him is to suffer with him. So I need, so there, why do you think he had to come? He didn't just, I need you to get this. He could have saved us however he wanted to. I need you to get it in your spirit. Think about it theologically. But God chose to allow Jesus to experience every struggle we would ever experience so that whatever he has already felt, I did not create that feeling. See, the Lord created everything that's ever existed. The way you feeling wasn't your idea. The weight of that pain was not created by you. That tear is not created by you. That tear is created by him. That he allow, allows me to live in it and live it out because the same way he got through it is going to be how he gets me through it. So, every, Jesus is eight years old. He gets circumcised. He feels pain. He grows up and everybody misunderstands him. You've been misunderstood. He gets it. He goes through a fast, experiences starvation. He gets it. He, he, he gets tempted by the devil. He gets it. He, he, he experiences loneliness. He gets it. He, he, he goes through he, the sand. He, people are against him. I'm trying to get you to see everything you're feeling. I'm not the first one to feel it. Let me read the text again so we get it. For the sufferings of Christ abound in us. So our consolation also abounds through Christ. Which means the way I get through it is the way he got through it. Oh God. So he doesn't just let me feel what he feels. He has his Holy Spirit in me to help me get through what I'm feeling. So you don't just have a pain on the inside. You got the solution on the inside. You don't just have a struggle on the inside. You got the deliverance on the inside. Oh, I got to hurry. I got to hurry. And so here's the, here's the last thing. I got to hurry. Thank you all for letting me say a little bit late, but we're done it after this. So what is then? Look at verse 6. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. This is the significance of our comfort. The significance of our comfort, and I'm going to give you these real fast, and then we're going to pray. First of all, it's significant, letter A, in the life of God's servant. If we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. God's saying you are going to benefit from this. Let me say a sub point to it. God always prepares us for what he is preparing for us. Jesus. I need you to be comforted by what I'm about to tell you. He is preparing you for what he has prepared for you. They don't want it. Let me talk to them. He is prepared. Why did I lose my dot, dot, dot? Because he is preparing you for what he has prepared for you. And had you not gone through the loss, you wouldn't be prepared for what he's prepared for you. <sighs> That's the significance of my comfort. <sighs> but then it's not just in the life of God's servant, it's in the life of God's saints. And our hope for you, verse 7, is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. 
Let me give you these two blanks and we're praying. I am a comfort channel, not a comfort cistern. A cistern holds stuff. A channel distributes stuff. God has put enough comfort in you to distribute. Which is why the ultimate evidence that you are close to healing, that your grieving process is almost ended, the ultimate evidence is when now you can comfort somebody else. That's when you know you're all right. And so if you've not been able to talk about it in 15 years, you're still grieving. Here's the last blank, because we cannot give what we do not have. Does this, I hope this helps. I hope, if we, we have to apply it though, y'all. We have to apply it. Come on, put your notes away. Come on, if this helped, can you begin clapping your hands and thanking God? Come on, stand up on your feet. Come on, clap your hands and thank God. Woo, God, for this word. God, you're going, it, it's going to be, it's going, he's going to work this thing out for me. Come on, speak it over your life. Look at somebody, point at them and say heal. Just point at them and say heal. Heal.